Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Infinite Leaders Live. My name is Lewis Keynes and our why is simple, to be better educators and to be better humans. We want everybody, regardless of role, rank and responsibility, wherever they work, to be listened to, uh, to be willing to listen and to learn. I'm joined as ever by my mate in the desert, Alan. How are you doing, Alan? Yeah, good, thank you, Lewis. And it's, it's a bit cooler in the desert now, so I've uh, got my coat ready. And we will continue to focus on the things you don't get taught at university or any courses. Real life lessons from real life people with real life experience. And if you've listened to us before, you know we record live and we're learning as we go. Any constructive advice or praise, we'd love to hear. Get in touch with us on Instagram, YouTube um, and Twitter. Also at theinfinitelearners.com. And um, you can listen to our podcast on all good podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc., and we're also on YouTube and IGTV. So listen, learn, and be ready to share. Let's get stuck in, Alan. Yeah, get your pens and paper ready, guys. There's going to be some absolute gems of wisdom coming out of the show today. So Steve Boyle is our guest. He's the chair of the National Association of Physical Literacy Advisory Board and the principal founder of Two for One Sports, a national organization that brings physical literacy using sports sampling to children through camps and clinics in America. And Steve's philosophy on or focuses on uh, lifelong wellness by recognizing the mind-body connection and the value of nutrition and mindfulness as it relates to physical literacy. And, and Steve has taught and coached throughout the United States. His diverse background in teaching, athletic coaching, college advising, life coaching and counseling make him a highly sought after speaker and consultant. So welcome to the show, Steve. It's great to have you on and tell us a little bit more about your philosophy and, and, and lifelong wellness. All right. So, uh, well, first, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, it's terrific to be here, and uh, I know we're hours apart, um, uh, and and so I appreciate you uh, staying up late to get me up early. So this is a uh, it's fantastic to be up. Um, I'm calling in from Connecticut, uh, here in New England, um, and so my path to arrival here. I'll just sort of give you the the, the, the quick. So I'm a I'm a first generation Irishman. So I've, I'm I'm one of seven kids and. 77 first cousins. I got 26 nieces and nephews. So my network's big just inside my immediate family. But um, I grew up in upstate New York uh, with five brothers uh, and two sisters. Um, and so I was the, uh, I, I'm the, I'm the fourth. So I, I like to call myself the oldest middle child in the family. Uh, but what that really meant was that my brothers who are five, four, and three years older than me, beat the crap out of me at an early age so that I could complete any 2v2 contest we could play out in the street or in the front yard. So, um, and I, but I do share that because I do think I, 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 I wear that my competitiveness as a result of that, but also my compassion for what it's like to be the little guy uh, uh, in those situations. Um, I went to an all boys Catholic military high school. So I had the US Army and the Christian brothers fighting for young boys' minds at the same time. And uh, that, that had its own challenges, but um, from there, believe it or not, uh, at five foot eleven, I was probably the ninth best player on my uh, high school basketball team. But I walked onto a Division One team, and I'll probably share the story a little bit later uh, in a little more detail. Um, but I went from, you know, being a scrawny little guy to still being scrawny, but but starting against the likes of Notre Dame and Madison Square Garden as an eighteen-year-old, and so that led me on a a, a path in education. Um, after I graduated, I became a teacher coach in New York City. Uh, and then when I met my wife at a camp for children with cancer in, in New Jersey, um, I asked her to marry me um, at the camp. And we moved to Seattle, Washington. Uh, we thought we'd go for a year, came back uh, five years later with our first child. When I say came back, came back to the East Coast of the United States where all my family is. And we settled in, uh, in Connecticut. Um, it just it was one of those places where we were both teaching at Catholic schools. Um, and we said, hey, let's go to a boarding school because we had no money because we were Catholic school teachers. And we interviewed in places from Maine all the way down to DC. And we just couldn't find a spot that would take both of our backgrounds in terms of that given year. And so we said, whoever gets the good job, the other person will go back to school and get their master's degree. So I, uh, I always tell people I won because my wife got the good job and I got to go back to school. Uh, <laughs> and from there, I, I, um, I, I got a, a degree, a master's degree in school counseling, master in education. And I got a job at the local public high school doing what I really wanted to do. And that was um, be a counselor and a coach. Uh, and so from there, 
my wife was an athletic director at a local private school. We um, uh, I'm probably getting ahead of myself on some of this stuff, but um, we then started a program called 241 Sports. And um, I'll share with you guys a little bit about that um, uh, moving forward. But basically, it's, it's what has propelled us to be able to have national and international conversations like the one we're having right now around the concept of sports sampling and, and physical literacy. So we've been in Connecticut now for, oh gosh, it's over 20 years. It's hard to believe, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so life is good. Um, and uh, so anyway, I feel like I've been babbling and that's, that's enough of at least how I arrived here and I'll, I'll go in the direction you guys want me to from here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing your your journey, Steve. We we we'll, we'll love that, and it gives our listeners a chance to really get a feel for you. So, I, I love the part there where you had to go back to back to school, and you said you won. And I, I'm about to embark on my masters, actually. And what did that give you as a person? And then how did that influence the rest of your journey? Uh, it's a good question. You know. Um, it's fascinating as someone who then eventually became a college advisor was that um, it, was, it was amazing to me going back to school with the child and my wife expecting our second child, how important doing well was to me at that point. You know, part of it was, am I freezing on you guys a little bit? I, uh, I'm not sure if I can, um, I apologize. So when I went back to school, I had both the responsibility as parent, right? But also because of what I was embarking on, I had already had eight years in, in, in coaching and teaching under my belt. And because I was going to become a counselor, I really started to focus on those things that I felt were weaknesses of mine. And I was just blessed with, with one professor in particular who really taught me how to listen, right? And as a, as a counselor and coach, that's a skill that we often don't think of as a skill. It's how do you be quiet and become completely uh, uh, engrossed and in tune with your client, and right? And so, you know, and I often will, will, will quip that there's a really fine line between, I'll often say this, I do more counseling when I'm coaching and more coaching when I'm counseling. Uh, than you would be otherwise aware of. Because with coaching, it's around holding people accountable. It's about being a motivator. And with counseling, it's around listening, supporting, and then offering what you deem as objective advice, right? And so those two worlds really marry. And I, and I sort of knew that going right into my degree, that that was going to be really important for the work I was going to do in the future. And it's funny, you know, I went back when I was 28 years old, when I was an 18 year old, eh, if I get a C plus or if I sleep in and skip a class, you know, no big deal. I was, I was determined to get straight A's. I wasn't going to miss any classes. I actually did. It was a, it was a uh, 36 month, it was a 36 month masters that I did in 16 months. So I was doubling down on courses as well because I needed I needed revenue and I needed income. So I needed to get through the master so I could get, actually get a job. So, you know, you, you're motivated by different factors, but I was certainly motivated by the skill set I needed to develop through the courses. I, I want to come back to that, that listening part. I agree with you. I think listening is an, an absolute superpower, a superpower that's misunderstood and, and much more difficult than maybe people give it credit for. Just before we do loop back round to that, tell us a little bit about Two for One Sports because it sounds like a really special thing that you're building there. Uh, thanks, uh, Lewis. It, um, it's, it is our life's work pretty much at this point. So um, our oldest, the one who was born in Seattle, uh, the quick story goes that when she was nine here in Connecticut, she tried out for the local travel soccer team. And, you know, as... as Carrie, my wife, was an athletic director at a private school and me two miles away. I was coaching soccer at the time, as well, along with basketball and track and field. We just didn't want our kid to stink. Right? You, just, you just hope your kid is, is going to fit in and, and they're, they're not going to be sad or, or have negative experiences. But we get the call from the coach and he goes, your daughter's our number one prospect. And we're like, dude, she's nine, right? And so... All of a sudden, he starts to go on about how she's going to fit into the Brazilian style of play that he has and his whole system. And 
granted, we were, we were enamored by the fact that he thought our child was a good player. But at the same time, I was super skeptical. So after about 20 minutes of this, I say to him, well, look, my wife played lacrosse in college and Atlanta has shown some interest in lacrosse. Can you tell us what the conflict and the travel soccer schedule will be in the spring? The guy goes radio silent on us. Says, hold on a second in an angry voice as if he's gonna go talk to the guy in the back of the car dealership. And he comes back down and he says, we're no longer interested in your daughter. So went from number one prospect to no longer interested simply because she was shown as a nine-year-old interest in lacrosse. And so we, we said that night, look, we could shout from the mountaintops or we could do something about it. And we came up with the tagline, life's too short for just one sport. And that summer we put together a model of a, a sports sampling camp. And we actually, our first year called it Boyle's Three Season Sports Academy. And the whole idea was to bring back the, the three season athlete, you know, which, you know, at that time for our own kids was pretty much soccer, basketball, and lacrosse. And so the camp was soccer, basketball, lacrosse, and then a fourth activity we called Fitness Express. And we just kind of threw it together, had 65 girls show up the first, the first summer. We did it at the school where my wife was athletic director. But what was happening was moms and dads were holding the hands of their sons, dropping off their daughters, and they were saying, can you do this for the boys? So the next year we did a week of girls, week of boys. And then all of a sudden we're like, why are we separating the girls and the boys? Well, partly because the facility we had was too small. So we went to a, a, actually a competitor of my wife's school across town, went to them and said, hey, we'd like to bring this model. We changed it to 241, taking the 241 from life's too short for just one sport, call it 241 sports. We didn't want our name to sort of, you know, boils, you know, we wanted to be able to sort of bring it uh, more from a philosophy standpoint than from a person standpoint. And within four years, we were recognized by the Aspen Institute as one of eight model programs in the United States. And so I got asked to go down and talk about, that's actually where I met uh, Peter Davis, Allen, who, who I recently connected you with. Um, he, he was the uh, moderator of a panel I was on. And our connection to Project Play has really propelled us to be part of the international conversation. And the year after that, Michelle Obama was speaking at, at Project Play, and I got to introduce the concept of physical literacy on stage right after she got off. Billie Jean King was there. You know, the next year, Kobe Bryant was there. I mean, so it was really, it was that sort of 30,000 foot, you know, sort of all star superstar uh, audience, and then grassroots providers like us that were delivering boots on the ground. So now, with 241, we've had our first camp in Canada this last summer. Uh, we've been out in Denver, Colorado for about five years now. We just secured agreements with um, uh, two places in North Carolina. We've got six or seven programs around Connecticut. So we're growing at a rate that um, is really exciting. Um, but most exciting is the fact that out of a moment of outrage of this one coach telling my daughter she couldn't play another sport. We've now influenced thousands and thousands of other people as a result of that moment. And that feels pretty special. And I should point out, she went on to be a two-time All-American in lacrosse. <laughs> and, and, and so had, had, we not, had we not pushed back, um, uh, you know, her, her life path would have been different as well. Yeah, certainly. And I really, I really like that sort of seminal moment that you talked about and, and, and the knock on effect that that's had and the, the sort of um, drive and the acceleration that your project has had. And I, I really like this tagline of life is too short for one sport, which is where, where the numbers come from. Um, tell us what, what the whole aim of two for one sport is. Just, just fill us in a little bit about why, why is it so bad for children to specialize in a sport at a young age? Why can't a nine-year-old be labeled as, as the next best thing and, uh, and be pigeonholed as a footballer? And, and why should that multi-sports approach be something that, that every school and, and every organization considers in the development of children? Yeah, so I, 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 again, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I suppose it's one of the things that gets me up out of bed every day is to I mean, I think about my own experience in sport, I and mean, I shared about playing with my brothers, and you know, a lot of it was just the opportunity for me to try different things and to also develop my own identity. I was, I was a much better soccer player and footballer than I was a basketball player, but quite honestly, 
my brothers were really good at football and I wanted to be better than them at something. And so that was the other thing is playing soccer helped me miss basketball. There was something about the fact that I wasn't like, I see these kids that play, you know, year round one sport. And there's, I mean, we all know the, the, the phrase absence makes the heart grow fonder, but I think that can happen in athletics as well. I mean, there is, you know, Wayne Gretzky would often talk about just he couldn't wait to hang up the skates by the end of hockey season because he got to go and do something else. What well, was doing that something else that he realized how special he was at his eventual sport that, that, made his, that made his fame. I think the other thing that happens is, Lewis, when you said someone gets labeled, well, kids don't self-label, right? They're usually doing it to please adults. And so those adults are often parents or they're doting coaches who like, you know, the, the coach who was saying to Atlanta, you can't play lacrosse, that's a business model for some of those guys as well, right? If he gets the good athlete, whether she's destined to be a footballer or not, she's a good athlete at nine years old, going to help that program win. And if that then, and kids aren't dumb, they understand you're choosing me because I'm pretty good and you want to win. Well, then the feedback loop is, I'm really good. And I want to win because I want to keep staying on this team. Well, really what they want to do is they want to, these are their new friends. Like, of course they want to stay on the team. That's, this is their social experience. So I think if we don't put programs together that allow kids to sample other sports, then they might not find what they were destined to do. You know, I remember when I, my, one of my first gigs out in Seattle was I was coaching a freshman basketball team and kid comes out for the, for the basketball team and he's a little guy, right? He's literally like four foot 10, maybe about 95 pounds. And, but he was scrappy and I loved him because I was, you know, at five foot 11, believe me, I was always the shortest guy in a division one basketball court. So I always loved the little guys. So anyway, the head coach says, we can't carry this kid. He's just too small. And I said, come on, come on. He says, no. So the, he, the coach says, no, you can't. That kid as a ninth grader goes out for wrestling because he got cut and was like, I'm not, I got to do something. He goes out for wrestling. He was a state champion wrestler as a ninth grader. And so, but because he had only identified with basketball up to that point in his life, he was never going to grow. Well, he was a four-time state champion who went on to play in college. Had he not got the opportunity to see, now I'm not saying cut kids so that they can go, but it's an, it's an anecdote that sort of shows that this kid may have never otherwise gotten exposed to that particular sport. We had a kid come to our camp who was a soccer only kid, greatest goalie in the area. She comes just because some of her friends were doing the camp. She's going into the eighth grade as having played only soccer. We introduced her to basketball. We introduced her to lacrosse. She goes to high school. She becomes a starter in all three of those sports. And she becomes an All-American goalie in lacrosse and plays lacrosse for four years at the University of Connecticut. Had we not exposed her to those other sports, she probably would have burned out, in my opinion, as a soccer only kid, because at that point she was playing on multiple teams. She was such a good goalie that, you know, people would pick her up at these tournaments and that's all she was doing was, was standing in net. And she actually loved the pace of, of lacrosse because it's just a faster game. So anyway, I mean, I could go on and on about what the benefits are, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, it's important to look at all the different benefits. Is there, a, is there a method behind the sports that you choose to deliver in the camp, Steve? Is there some rationale be, be behind why you choose the, the ones that you do? Sure. So we, we will, whenever we do camps, clinics, we look at sort of what are the sports of the season and the, and the region. Now, our summer programs, we don't care about season so much, except we have to make sure this important factor. We never want to introduce a sport to a kid where that sport's not available to them in the community where they are trying out that sport. So for example, we have actually found um, ultimate Frisbee and fencing to be two very popular sports uh, at our camp because there's actually a lot of crossover from the skills from a team dynamic and from a, a, an individual sports skill of those two sports. But if we have a fencing group come in and introduce fencing, there better be an opportunity for our kids to be able to join that fencing group. Otherwise, we're not going to introduce the sport because what would be worse than getting a kid excited about something, they go home and say, mom, I love team handball, but there's no place to play team handball, right? 
um, especially if it's something as niche and as specialized from an equipment standpoint as something like fencing, right? Uh, because I think that that's, that's really important. But for the most part, what we're going to do, we, we wind up doing our sports, uh, at, as you can imagine, at a lot of secondary schools, uh, uh, you know, middle or high schools. So we're, we're almost always going to offer sports that are offered at that particular school, right? So, you know, we, like field hockey, for example, is a pretty regional sport here in the United States, and it's primarily female only. I know fem, um, field hockey is played by men almost predominantly around the rest of the world, but in the United States, it's, it's, it's 95% women. And so if that's, we're not going to introduce field hockey at a school that doesn't have field hockey as an opportunity for the kids to be able to play themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, we were talking off air earlier, Steve, just about the importance of unstructured play. Yeah. And we, we, we gave the example of, of my kids who, who've moved away from the Philippines, having, having doing two hours of structured coaching every night after school and, and fixtures at a weekend. And, and we've come to Saudi Arabia there's no fixtures due to COVID. There's no structured coaching. But what they have got is a, a three and a half hour window between three o'clock and 6.30 where they go out on their bikes and they play and they're at the recreation centre playing basketball or football. How important is that in the development of a child? Look, I, I would, to me, when people talk about, hey, I can't wait to get back to normal, to what, what I say to them is, is it normal for the kids to wake up in my town on a, Friday, on, on a Friday morning, have to miss school that day to drive 475 miles down to Virginia to play in a tournament against a team that lives 11 miles from us? Like that's, that's what was normal before COVID. If I could picture something, Alan, that would be a dream as a result, one of the gifts of COVID, as I call it, would be what you just described. I mean, I, I swear to God, when, when we went into lockdown here, I, I was like, who, where did all these bikes come from? Like the, I mean, everybody in the neighborhood had bikes and skateboards and dads and sons were rollerblading and passing the hockey ball back, uh, puck back and forth to each other on the street. And it reminded me of, you know, what we had growing up, which was just be home by dinner, right? Or just be home by dark. And, but kids don't hear that anymore because what it is, is, hey, I got to drive you to your 14th practice of the week and or, you know, your eight game tournament uh, that starts on Saturday morning and you're playing every other hour. And what happens then is the kids who make those teams start to get an ego and start to feel special about themselves. And often it's false, right? It's, it's really what it is, is you just got bigger faster, right? You're an early bloomer. And it then locks out some of the late bloomers. Well, what would happen with what you're describing about, about your kids right now, Alan, is they're just sort of, they're discovering, right? And so part of what they might do is, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of tired of playing, playing soccer this week. Uh, why don't we try stickball? Why don't we try, you know, something where we just make it up where it's a combination of games. And then all of a sudden they're discovering the crossover of one skill to the next. And then when they get back to that other game, they realize they missed it in the same way I was talking about before. So I would say up until age 12, you're in the dream scenario because adults aren't getting in the way. After 12 then, Steve, what, what, what's your recommendations there? Because you've used that magic mark there. Is, is there any difference? Should there be any difference? Is it okay for kids to just carry on playing and not getting coaching at that age? Yeah, you know, I, I use 12 because there's some science out there that says, you know, if you were to pick a number between males and females, that's probably the average number where, you know, to develop physical literacy, that's, that's the, the sort of the magic spot, right? But I would argue that if you do long-term athlete development, right, if you do physical literacy development, right, those kids are going to self-select to want to play other sports, right? Because what will happen is, first of all, look, one, one example I've, I've often given is we all know those kids who are really good tryout kids. Those are the dancers to me, right? Kid comes in for a soccer tryout and they can do a coif and they can do a Maradona and they can do a scissors and they can juggle 74 times and balance it on their head. But then 
if they've got to run down a breakaway, they give, they give up 20 meters in, right? But the competitors, the multi-sport athletes, they're going to do anything and everything they can to run down that breakaway and make sure that that, that person doesn't score that goal, right? Because they're going to do the same thing, whether they're playing lacrosse or basketball or they're the anchor in track and field. So what I, what I find is it's really important for um, to allow kids the opportunity when they get to 12, 14 years old, basically when they're going into what we would call high school uh, here in the States, that they have an opportunity to play more than one sport. If they've only been identified as just soccer, just basketball, just field hockey, they're much less likely to then be that multi-sport athlete. And that to me is sad. When I look back on my high school experience, I remember my soccer a lot more than I did basketball, but basketball was what sort of shaped my future for whatever that's worth to you guys. No, you're exactly right. And I almost wish back in my childhood, I'd have had a much more multi-sport approach. I was very much down the line of, of football and cricket. And, and that was about it really. And I really regret not being uh, having access to gymnastics or to badminton or to tennis. And, and I think that does then stick with you for the rest of your life. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your core values, Steve. I, I know you've, you've talked about your, your philosophy for 241. Um, what, what about your own individual core values? Yeah, you know, look, at, one of the things we try to do in our, in our lives is, is we do try to simplify things. And so when I think about, you know, core values, certainly um, probably the, the I, I, I try to live by what I would call the Maya Angelou effect, right? And the Maya Angelou quote that, People won't remember what you did or what you say nearly as much as how you made them feel. And so there are times where when I look back on my career, especially with my impact on, on, on young people, is the ones that, that keep you up at night are those times where you didn't live by that, right? Where um, the, if... if I, I, I get worried way more about the two to three kids or players or athletes where I had a negative impact on their soul, as opposed to probably what would be the thousands where I, I'd like to think I had a positive impact. And so I, I think that that now, especially that I'm older, um, is a real guiding principle to make sure I'm, when I leave somebody, I've made them feel important. I, I, I've made them feel at least positive in a way that had I not been in their life, they wouldn't have felt. The other thing I think I try to live by from a kind of a leadership standpoint, or whenever I'm uh, working with schools, municipalities, organizations, families, trying to help kids get into colleges, is, is I'm always looking for win-win situations, right? And I think that's the middle child in me. It's kind of the mediator, it, but it's also the fun part of entrepreneurship is, how do I take a situation and figure out the puzzle that both groups or everybody involved with whatever the situation is, is going to have a gain as a result of it. To me, that's really fun. That's the fun part of leadership. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a, that's a challenge that gets me up every day. Can I um, loop back to what I, I promised earlier, Steve? Um, you said there that you wanted to really work on making children feel important. And uh, I really empathize with what you've said there. You, you know, as educators, oftentimes um, we, we do focus on maybe some of the things we got wrong and hold on to those a little bit too long and, and not look at all the positive um, impact we're making as well. But to make few people feel important, it's really important to listen to them, isn't it? T tell us how you've to, to describe to us your journey of, of listening and improving as a listener. How do you do that without judgment? How do you listen and really hear what's being said? How do you consider what's going to happen next, despite your preconceptions and, 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 your, and um, your ideas of what should be? Um, how, how does that work for you? Yeah, so uh, I think it started when I first started teaching on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I was at an all boys Catholic school in 56 different ethnicities, um, 16 different religious denominations at a Catholic school. 
Um, I taught a, a, an honors English class with 38 desks and 52 kids in it. Uh, two of the kids didn't speak any English in my honors English class. So what I did to try to connect with them is I gave them all those, uh, I, we call them marble notebooks. They're sort of hard covered notebooks that, uh, that kind of have black and white sort of marbly look on the front. And I, I bought all, every one of my students one of those because I was teaching both theology, basically morality and decision-making and I was teaching uh, English. And so those, um, those books I gave them were journals. And so I would give a prompt uh, on, the, on the board, or I would just say, write whatever you want to me. And I got to tell you, my first year teaching, that's all I did was read journals and write back to kids. And if it was something that um, I felt warranted a conversation, that's what I would do. But it was an opportunity for kids to say things to me that they might not otherwise say in person. And sometimes it was hard for me to hear because uh, I told them, I said, look, I, I want you to be critical. I kept doing that uh, as a coach. And so as opposed to doing end of the year sort of formal evaluations, I just asked all of my players to write me a letter and I would ask them to be as critical as possible. And it really helped me impact the future by, by having those letters written to me. And look, I, I have a folder up in my office because again, 95% of it is positive but the five, it's the 5% that you remember, right? The 95% all sort of molds together. Yeah, I like coach, he's such a nice guy, makes me feel special, yada, yada, yada. But it's that 5% of how didn't I connect? Where did I go wrong? Like, wh what was it about the way I made that child feel that they're looking back on their experience with me as negative? And so I think part of listening is not only listening to that person, but also recognizing that that person exists in the future. And I wanna make sure I'm not repeating mistakes, that this person has offered me a gift because of whatever negative feeling they had towards me. And I need to honor that by learning from it. And then, and I would tell them that, this is, you have no idea how valuable this is to me. And I think that then mends whatever relationship was lost. Because a lot of times, look, we've all had this experience, right? Where a kid comes back to you 20 years later and says, you have no idea, but you said something to me in the hallway and it impacted my life. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I had no idea. But at the same time, we also need to recognize we've probably done that on the negative side and we never learn about it because that person never came back to tell us. And so what you want to really understand is that especially any leadership position, teacher, coach in particular, there's an awesome responsibility with being a teacher coach. We literally impact the way people feel for the rest of their lives. And that's, that's both awesome, but scary at the same time. I love Look. that idea of, about you, you, you're looking after their future self and, and you've got to consider that the idea that this is a succession plan and, and all you're doing is, is guiding them and supporting for what essentially will be quite a short period of their time. Now, with, with that in mind, um, I wonder if, if you would go a little bit further for us and maybe share with us if you would if, if you would feel comfortable some of those feedbacks from that five percent what were the kind of things that stuck with you and that you listened to from those students that said actually coach this bit you didn't do very well yeah um you know i, th I think early on and again like everyone's tendency when you're when you're young is you think you think you're better than you are right and you know you when you're 25 and, and, and you start to I think part of what I learned from some of them was a couple of things. Uh, for my first couple of years, I didn't understand. I was coaching a lot of girls and I haven't grown up with brothers, college basketball, teaching all boys when I, it was God's way of saying, you're going to have daughters at some point as I was coaching a lot of girls and it was, and it was different. I, I would often quip that with boys, you had to tear down the individual and build up the team because they just want to dribble through everybody and score by themselves. With girls, you had to tear down the team and build up the individual because they would often, you know, at least in my experience, would be like, yeah, but she was open and she's my friend. I didn't want her to be mad, so I had to pass. I'm like, you were wide open. Just shoot the ball. But so there was part of what was happening is the feedback I was getting was that I was being too competitive. My focus was on winning um, more than it was on, on development. And... The other thing was that 
and I didn't think I was playing favorites, but I got enough feedback from people that I was, I was not valuing the entire team, right? And so that was a gift to learn that because when I look back on my older teams, you know, fast forward 15 or 20 years, the feedback I got was that you would never know who the superstar was. And had I not gotten the early feedback about playing favorites or not valuing the whole team, I wouldn't have realized how important it is to pay attention to number 19 on the roster versus number two or number one on the roster. Because building culture is really what it's all about. And I then came to learn that by treating everybody equally, wins and losses just take care of themselves, right? And, and so when, if, 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 you're, if you're going through the process the right way and you're building good culture, you're valuing relationship, then wins and losses are just a byproduct of that, right? And, but if, if you focus on wins and losses, kids pick that up and they start to, they start to either resent you for overemphasizing winning or they join with you and there's a division amongst those kids that are hyper competitive and those who are not. So, I mean, I, I can go on about my failures, but I, I think anecdotally that is, uh, uh, th those ones stand out to me in terms of, of not playing favorites. I love that idea that you, you've, you know, you've been vulnerable enough to put yourself out there and ask the students for a letter. I think that's a cracking idea that I'm certainly going to magpie myself at some stage through coaching and teaching and, and give children that opportunity to be really honest. And did you do that anonymously? I wonder, Steve, or was that something that the children were, were comfortable enough to share with you with their names on? Yeah. So I, I always gave them the option and, um, and they could deliver it in whatever means that they wanted. So often what would, what would happen was I, I'd have a giant manila envelope and if, if they wanted to, they could, you know, I found that probably 90 to 95% would put their name on it. And the problem when you do that is this process of elimination, of course. And so the kids don't always know that. I, but I, I do think it's important because look, I mean, as, as educators, and, and I know there's many administrators on here, you, know, you can always put on a show when you know you're being evaluated, right? You know, it's, it's, I, got my teach, I got my teacher evaluation coming, I got my coach evaluation coming, I got my end of the season discussion with the athletic director but who's a better evaluator than you than your own players, right? I mean, in, in terms of who matters. So, and if you start to see common themes about what resonates and what doesn't, the other thing I'll, I'll point out that I probably should have is that in most of the letters, whether it was females or males, of the, when I would ask them, what was your most memorable experience about the season? Almost none of it ever had to do with the sport, right? It had to do with bus rides. It had to do with when we do a service trip together. It had to do with the psych party. It had to do with something that was social and fun for them. But it wasn't, you know, you know, when we when we qualified for the state tournament on the last second goal. You know what I mean? It was that, and that's that was other feedback that was really important. It's the relational, the peripheral stuff around being part of of a magical experience that again, wins just take care of themselves. Like that stuff is not the memorable stuff. Like that's just, that's just what happens when you're part of a special experience. So that was also really important for me is to, is to build in the magic as much as I could moving forward. And we found that Alan, haven't we, with, uh, with, with working with, with students at, uh, in, in British School Manila was, they, they constantly could recall their memorable moments and their highlights as as things like you said that were largely nothing to do with the sport and more to do with the social side of things and even to the point that a month after an important tournament they couldn't tell you the color of the medal they won they, they might have forgotten because there's so much happened in the two or three days um Absolutely. alan go on yeah I, I was just going to touch upon there that how important is getting the parents involved in this as well yeah look when you're in today's society, when you're culture building, um, if you if you ignore the parents, then obviously that's that's just not wise. So again, this was sort of trial and error. What I have found, it, and look, it, it's easier to do if you come from a strong sport background, if you have experience. I mean, I, mean, I remember first quipping when I was um, 
uh, started teaching in New York City, I said, my God, I wish the parents would get more involved. And then I moved to Seattle and I would say, God, I wish these kids were orphans. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, especially as a young teacher coach, dealing with the parents can be the hardest part, right? And when I was dealing with parents before I had children, that was even more challenging. So I think a lot of it is, and, 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 and this is something I've learned in business and in, certainly in running programs, be as transparent as possible up front about what your expectations are and don't make the rules up as you go along. So when, when you are uh, doing your parent meetings and when you're communicating to parents, and it's super important, but I might err on the side of oversharing and over-involving the parents to an, giving them information, but not asking for their advice, right? Because once you start asking for parental advice, especially generally, then that then you're inviting a problem, especially if it's around things like, you know, God forbid, X's and O's or, or uh, you know, philosophy pieces. Because it, it, first of all, it exudes a lack of confidence. Um, it's a lack of professionalism, but then you're opening up, um, you know, the gates for, for what could be. Now, that said, if you are having trouble with a player, then bringing a parent in to, to have a conversation to sort of, from an empathy standpoint, then that would be important. So, so sorry, I'll go ahead. It looks like you had a question for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in linking that back to the student feedback now. Now, would you then go to a parent and do a similar thing with a letter or a feedback form or an evaluation? Yeah, uh, you know, I, <laughs> usually you get that anyway, right? Um, you know, you, 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 <laughs> yeah, you, 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 without, without even asking for it, and, and what I have found too, and, and I'm at this point, like I, I'm like everybody else. I don't love confrontation, but I want to avoid it. The, the, the other piece of advice that I would offer from experience here is that never reply to an email at night, right? Um, never reply to an email if you've had a glass of wine <laughs> and try to, give, try to give it 24 hours. But I almost never answer emails anymore because what I have found is most emails I get from parents, especially on the negative side, have come because of a glass of wine or because they're tired or because they just sent an upset child to bed. And so what I will often do is wait a certain amount of time and then pick up the phone. And most parents are like, I'm, you know, and they're super apologetic because then you can join with them, right? And be like, look, I, I, I get it. So I, I think the dilemma, Alan, if I were to do the same thing about having parents write the letters, is they would turn into offering me unsolicited advice <laughs> that I'm not really interested in, right? And, and so I, I, the feedback I get from kids is way more important than parents. But that said, I think helping parents understand your philosophy, like the other thing is like for, for our approach on life's too short for just one sport, most coaches and teachers we talk to and parents in the back room believe it. They get it. They, they're like, they're excited about it. But then when you ask them to put it into practice, and this is parents in particular, they're not willing. They're like, yeah, why don't we let everybody else do that multi-sport thing where I'm going to send my kid to the driving range for three hours, or I'm going to hire a personal hitting instructor, or I'm going to hire a personal trainer, you know, for my nine-year-old while everybody else is doing that. Even though philosophically they agree with you, yet they don't put into practice those those particular pieces. So now look, I'm not anti-parent. Obviously, I am one. I wanted to be involved in my, my kids, you know, sort of lives to, to, to a certain capacity. It's just that I don't want to let that be the tail that I'm chasing. You know what I mean? And because I think it's just, it's not wise. Lewis? So, so would that come back full circle, Steve? And, and would that be suggestive that what we should do is, is listen and, and ask the parents to listen to their coach and ask the parents to listen to their children. And, and those decisions would become very apparent and very clear. Yeah, I, look, I, I think if you take a proactive, wise approach and communicate that upfront, 
and give some structure to when it's appropriate for you to engage with me, but to always make sure that, well, it's just, it's, it's building relationship, it's building trust. And you do that in a confident way up front. And you, you don't shy away from parents, you engage with them to that capacity. But yes, I think part of it is teaching parents how to engage with your kids, right? Because what I have found is that if you don't do that with parents, the cancers grow at the dinner table. The cancers grow on the drive home. It, it, it happens with, you know, why aren't you playing more? Why doesn't the coach see what I see, right? Or why is Julie starting over you? Julie's slow and she doesn't, you know, she never does good out there, right? And so trying to help parents understand how negative that can be to trying to build the culture that you do and, and, and given parents sort of direction in terms of these are some things you should be saying or doing to, to, to support the program. But it also goes back to what I was saying before. If, if I truly am playing favorites and I'm only paying attention to the starters and not paying attention to the end of the roster, well, that, that's also, parents have reason to complain. You're, you're not valuing my son or daughter. And so I, I should catch some grief for that. But if I'm doing all those other things that I promise I'm gonna do, which is value every member of the team equally, the parent complaints turn into parent compliments and parent appreciation. So if, we, if we're valuing the students and we're being clear with our communication and we're listening to the students as a coach, then parents should be confident that they can listen to the coach and, and, and be well looked after. Yeah, I, I would think so, Lewis. And, and again, you're still gonna get the crazy parent that that's really challenging. But I think one of the things we've learned as educators and teachers and coaches is that you can only be as consistent as you possibly can be. And trust that for the most part, you're gonna win over most, most families. And then that becomes the momentum that you're looking for. But yes, I think generally speaking, that if we do all those other things, you're going to gain parent confidence and they're gonna become your allies uh, through, through this, as opposed to your adversaries in this process. I mean, it's no fun when parents are adversaries. It's, it's, it's horrible. But again, I would also say, you know, doing those other pieces that we talked about before that are the social experiences, let's involve parents in that. Let, let's have them see the magic of the kids being together at, at dinner parties and, and on trips and on, and on other pieces. And let's do some clear communication around, hey, this is what we're gonna do this week uh, in practice. This is our schedule coming up. Here's a recap. Uh, and then here's a special anecdote that I wanna share with you all. I think parents like that piece. Now, the flip side is, you know, I've dealt with a lot of programs and kids where parents don't have email, right? They, they're working two, three jobs. And so we also have to be conscious. Sometimes in our communities, we have, we have those kids, like where, where, I, where I've coached a lot, I've got kids on what we would call welfare, public assistance, and I got kids in million dollar homes sharing the same roster, right? And so you also have to be very conscious of who your total audience is when you're doing those communications. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, Steve, we, we're going to move on to our quick fire questions now. And our first okay. quick fire question is going to be slightly specific to you. And, and upon doing a bit okay. of research, I, I understand you've shared a stage with uh, quite an incredible female leader, um, Michelle Obama, uh, the former first lady of the United mm -hmm. States. Tell us about that. Give us a quick rundown of that experience. Yeah, so I mean, I gotta tell you, I, I'm, uh, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to sort of capture it in, in the right words. When I had heard that she was going to be speaking at the conference where I was asked to introduce the concept of physical literacy, um, I mean, she, to me, in in America, one of the things we are missing, uh, we don't have a ministry of sport. And we're seeing it really manifest right now as a result of COVID. And I do remember after sharing the stage with her, writing a newsletter that I think that we should appoint her the ministress of sport, the director of ministry for, for sport. And it was just amazing to me the some of the negative feedback I got because it showed me how divisive our country can be. Like I, ha I had a couple of families say, I'll never send my kid to one of your camps again. 
as because I had suggested that this person who, who grew up in a way that valued sport and valued movement and valued health, you are no longer going to allow your child to come to my program. I thought, okay. Wow. So, I mean, I will just tell you that for me, one of the things about the Obamas that just strikes me is just how familial they are, how welcoming they are. So um, at this particular conference, there was only a couple hundred people and she was on stage having a conversation with her brother, Craig, who wanted to be in a you know, division one uh, basketball coach. And then at the time was working for the New York Knicks. Well, I was sitting next to their mother uh, while they were talking on stage and their, their father has passed, as you might know. And just the warmth of, like, I, I wound up watching the mom watch her kids as much as I was watching them talk to each other because her pride in watching her, her, her son and daughter um, like it was just like, I, you know, I get goosebumps just, just thinking about it. They're just real people. Right. And, um, and, and, and so for me, it was, that was, that was a pretty special day. Yeah. I can imagine she, she's been, uh, a popular choice to the following question, which three leaders in history would you go out for a meal with Steve? You know, it's, it, uh, gosh, um, it, it's funny because you, you know, I actually sent this question when it's something we talked to, to my kids about uh, all the time. And so I, we're a pretty political house. And so my three daughters are all heavily involved in politics as, as with my wife. And so, um, I, you know, when I, when I think about this question, part of my head goes to, I want to have a, a, I want to have a laugh. I want to learn something and I want to make sure that everybody at the table is getting along. I, 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 had, a, I had a friend who one of the things he did, which was, was really cool is once a month, he would host a dinner party and he would invite two couples that didn't know each other, but that he knew well. And it was always a coming together. And, and I've become really good friends with some of the folks that I met at that particular table. So it's funny, when I think about this, I wanna make sure the conversation is good. So I think I need a coach. So I'd probably go with John Wooden, all right? I think I would, you know, having, having met Michelle Obama been with her. I've not been in the same room as her husband, so I would probably bring Barack. And I and I've always been a Malcolm X guy, and I just kind of feel like that would be a cool conversation. John Wooden, Malcolm X, and Barack Obama, and me just listening to the three of them have a chat. So uh, I don't know. I, I I guess that that's where I'd go. Um, so anyway, yeah. There there you have it. Super. I love that one. Yeah, that's I like that. I, I love the rationale there about laugh, learn, and get along. I really like to take that forward. That's my magpie for today, Louis. Definitely. <laughs> um, what were we've talked a lot about your core values? What are your non-negotiables as a leader? Um, you, I think one of the non-negotiables is to never have non-negotiables. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I'm only half joking about that. I'm, I mean, I think there really is something about um, trying to have, you know, a level of flexibility and that it's not my way or the highway. I mean, I, I do think there are, there are some things that, um, you know, you, you, you just, if it was to come down to one thing, it would be treat others the way you want to be treated. Right. And then call yourself out on that when you're not practicing what you preach and be prepared to call out others who, who, who aren't doing it as well. Right. In other words, I get, I get so tired of people who live in glass houses, right. That they just, you know, it's always negative. They're always throwing stones at everybody else and they're not self-reflecting. And look, I can get caught up in that, but I think it's really important to live by the golden rule. Um, when you when you're when you're in leadership is you know what am, am i am i addressing this colleague this, this parent this child the way that i want to be treated and if i'm not i'm missing the point yeah and, and that that might be answer to this next one that i'm going to throw in for you steve um if you were to hire a billboard on the side of the street what would you write on it well, from a marketing standpoint, I'd have to say life's cheap work. <laughs> uh, you know, but I, but I suppose, 
it's also a philosophy thing as well. I mean, it, 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 that is a lot of our life's work at this point, and it is unique and niche to what we do. Um, and so even as a coach, I was always going after the, you know, if I was trying to build a lacrosse program, I'd go after the basketball and soccer kids and say, hey, why don't you come try this? But then I'd tell that lacrosse kid, hey, I want to make sure you're, you're... so I, I do live and, 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 and try to practice that. Um, you know, I suppose the only other thing I would do is oh, well, I have a pet peeve about billboards, the ones that have too many words on there because I'm driving and I'm like trying to read the whole thing before <laughs> I get past it. It would be so, something around the Maya Angelou effect of, of you know, uh, just making sure you're, you know, you're leaving a legacy of making people feel good about you. That might, that might be too many words to read as you go past, but I get the gist of it, Steve. Yeah, yeah. For <laughs> Top sure. Man, Steve. <laughs> Um, thanks a lot for coming on, Steve. Really, really enjoyed that conversation. Um, and, oh, for and, sure. And, and your insights and, and a few of those uh, those takeaways are very, very valuable. And I love that idea of being a, a leader that's collaborative, uh, that listens, um, and, and not just to, to colleagues, but to uh, to the students and the and the, the children that you coach so much and, and shares that information with, with parents to educate them and, and to pull everybody along together. Well, again, I, having the opportunity to talk about it is really helpful for me. It's a, it's a good reminder and I uh, you know, love, love talking to folks like yourselves and uh, appreciate being on. Thanks a lot, Steve. Guys, search Infinite Leaders Live on YouTube and IGTV and all popular podcast platforms. Remember to visit theinfinitelearners.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks again to Steve. Top man, Steve. Thanks, Steve.